Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Corey Johnson, Speaker of the New York City Council and Acting Public Advocate for the City of New York. I want to welcome you all to this first of two oversight hearings on 3 one the city's non-emergency hotline and notification service. I want to thank Governmental Operations Chair Fernando Cabrera and Technology Committee Chair Peter Koo for their leadership today in calling this joint hearing and their commitment to ensuring that the people of New York City have easy and ready to access uh, to their government uh, through through and one and we also joined today by Councilmember Kalman Yeager uh, from Brooklyn and Councilmember Eric Ulrich uh, from Queens. As laid out in the city's charter, the public advocate is the ombudsman for the city of New York and has the responsibility to quote, monitor the operation, service complaint programs of city agencies and make proposals to improve such programs. This role of the public advocate is complementary in many ways to the oversight author authority of the City Council. So I'm here today in both of my roles for the discussion about how the Theron One system is functioning and how it can get even better. In a couple of weeks, we will have a second hearing uh, on agency response to Theron One service complaints, what agencies do once they get a throw in one request. So I'd ask that we focus on how the throw in one system is functioning today and wait to engage on agency response times at the next hearing that we're gonna have. Uh, after it launched in 2003, our throw in one system quickly became the largest non emergency call center in the nation. We consolidated more than 40 different city hotlines down to two numbers, 911 for emergency services and 311 for all other uh, service requests. Since the 2003 Northeast blackout, 311 has been a constant companion to New Yorkers in times of borough-wide and citywide crisis. It is through service requests that the city is able to quickly analyze data on problem areas in the city and we hope respond in a timely and appropriate manner and I guess that's gonna be the big question uh, for the next hearing. Our 3 one system fielded over 42 million contacts in 2018. That is the most contacts of any city in the United States by far. Other big cities uh, who have 3 one systems don't even come close to that volume. The city of Chicago, the city of Los Angeles, the city of Washington, D.C., and the city of San Francisco, none of them came close to reaching 4 million calls in each of those cities in 2018, so we are almost 10 times that uh, in the volume that we receive. It is an impressive volume of contacts that our system handles, but what is less impressive is how outdated our system is. The solutions and technology of 2003 are serving New Yorkers in 2019, and that, I believe, is unacceptable. Other cities are moving past us and showing us the areas where we can and must improve. For example, Chicago, Los Angeles, Washington DC, and San Francisco, all the cities I mentioned before, all allow you to set up a throw in one account online where you can track all of your service requests in one place. Only our throw in one mobile app lets you do that. And then it only allows you uh, to do requests you submitted through the mobile app, not through telephone or not through the website. Uh, I understand that 3 one is trying to upgrade our technology uh, to support this right now, but we need to move faster to make that happen. Our mobile app is also severely limited compared to the other cities that I mentioned. It doesn't offer all of the complaint options that are available online or on the phone, so it doesn't match in any way what people see when they go to the website or they call into 3 one For example, if I have a problem with mold or bed bugs in my building, there is no option to submit that complaint on the mobile app. I can only submit it online or on the phone. It doesn't make any sense, and it's not acceptable in 2019. Perhaps not surprisingly, given its limitations, our mobile app has very low usage compared to phone calls and online through in one. The first way to address this problem, I believe, is to allow all complaints to be made through the mobile app. It's also very important that we take full advantage of the smartphone platform by allowing photos and videos to be attached to more complaints, such as for rodent conditions, blocked driveways, or noise complaints. 
We need to improve and publicize this app so New Yorkers will actually want to use it. Washington, D.C. lets you live chat with a 301 agent online. So if you have any questions while submitting your complaint, they can be answered on the spot. Our system doesn't allow that, but it should. Finally, it is urgent that we ensure that language is not a barrier for any New Yorker trying to access services or make a complaint. Both the Throne One website and the mobile app only seem to accept complaints in English. On the telephone, the automated system provides a few options for other languages, but then it reverts back to English. After giving you options for other languages, and no matter what language you subject, no matter what language you select, so if I selected Russian, or if I selected Haitian Creole, or I selected another language that's available for an interpreter, that choice is not shared with the operator. So then when you get on the phone with the operator and you chose Russian, and if you're someone who speaks Russian and you start speaking in Russian, they start saying to you, what language are you speaking? Even though you just indicated on the dial tone that you are looking for a Russian uh, interpreter or translator. Uh, the caller is then forced to ask for a translator again while the operator is guessing uh, what language uh, they are speaking. Uh, we've done a few trial runs on this um, and uh, sometimes it's been okay, other times it's, it's not been okay. Uh, last week we had a staff member here at the council who's Armenian uh, call up and uh, request Armenian and they were on the phone for 17 minutes um, just speaking in Armenian over and over and over again, and the uh, operator who got them just kept saying, what language, what language, what language? That's not the way to run a system like this in the most diverse city in the world. And I don't think I need to explain to anyone why that is completely unacceptable for language access uh, in our city. We are the most diverse city in the United States, and we are proud to be the home of millions of immigrants. The fact that we're not operating at the top of our game when it comes to language services of their own one is frankly a serious problem. This is New York, end of story. We have to do better. We need a cutting edge system for their own one that is responsive, adaptable, and able to mobilize city resources to resolve an issue quickly. We need to move uh, fast to make the improvements of their own one that our city needs. I look forward to hearing from Throne One Director Joe Morrisrow and Department of Information, Technology, and Telecommunications Commissioner Samir Sani. Commissioner, thank you for being here, about the ways in which the Throne One platform is being improved to meet the changing needs of New Yorkers so we can remain a national leader in city responsiveness. So I look forward to uh, hearing uh, your testimony today. Before we go to your testimony, I will, of course, want to turn it over to my uh, great co-chairs, and I also want to recognize that we have uh, a deputy commissioner uh, from Do It With Us, a friend of mine, someone I've known a long time, a great guy, uh, Dominic Berg. Uh, so thank you for, for being here, Dominic. It's good to see you. Um, so at this point, I want to turn it over to our governmental operations chair, Chair Cabrera. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Good afternoon. I am the chair of the Committee on Governmental Operations, Council Member Fernando Cabrera. We are pleased to be joined today by the speaker and acting public advocate, Corey Johnson, and the Committee of Technology Chair by my colleague, Council Member Peter Ku. Today we will be conducting oversight on the customer experience and operations of 311 itself. Although many of us have questions on agency responsiveness to request 311 uh, receives, we are asking that those questions be held for the follow-up hearing soon to be scheduled. We are also hearing two pieces of legislation today, one in each committee. The first being heard by the Committee on Governmental Operations is introduction uh, 188 of 2018, sponsored by Council Member Mario, in relation to procedures to be adopted by the 3111 call center for responding to certain repeat anonymous complaints against the same property. This bill will require 311 to identify private properties that are subject to repeated unsupported anonymous complaints, which might represent a pattern of harassment and to hold off 
on referring additional complaints of similar type to agencies for a period of time thereafter. The second is being heard by the Committee of Technology in relation to 311 and language access and will be discussed in further detail by my co-chair and the sponsor. However, as the Committee on Governmental Operations heard at our recent hearing on City Language Access Law 3 access law, 311 is vital for making the, the law succeed. If a New Yorker wants to make a complaint about the lack of language access services at an agency, they are told to call 311. If when they call 311, they cannot express their complaint to 311 because the process for reaching an interpreter interpreter is too difficult, then our ability to identify language access gaps in agency services will disappear as well. I look forward to our, our discussions today on these and other topics of importance related to 311 operations. I would like to thank the speaker and acting public advocate, Corey Johnson, for joining us today, my co-chair, council member, Cool for the importance he is placing on getting 311's technologies right, and the sponsor of the legislation being heard today, Councilmember Mario Menchaca. I would also like to thank our staff who were, who, whose work made this hearing possible, Brad Ree, Elizabeth Cron, Emily Forgeon, Zach Harris, Irene Bikoski, Patrick Mo Moverhill, and Sebastian Backey, as well as my own legislative director, Claire McLevain. I will now turn the microphone over to my co-chair to make an opening statement. Thank you, Chair Capel. Good afternoon. I'm Council Member Peter Ku, and I'm the chair of the Committee on Technology. I want to welcome you all to our hearing. We are pleased to be joined today by the speaker and acting public advocate, Corey Johnson, and the Committee on Government Operations, chaired by Council Member Fernando Cabrera. As mentioned by the speaker and Council Member Cabrera, the hearing will focus on 311 operations and customer service, and how the system could be improved to better serve New Yorkers. 311 works as an important link between city government and the public. New York City consists of immigrants from all over the world who speak many different languages. Ensuring the 311 provides language access for all New Yorkers wishing to use this service should be a priority. The current 311 system is based on old technology and needs to be updated. In 2014, a contract was signed with IBM to replace the old system with a new customer-oriented system. As part of the contract, IBM will create a system that would include a story-driven design for telephone, web, and mobile applications. Today, we will also discuss how the implementation of the new system will improve customer satisfaction and maintain New York City uh, leadership on 311 customer service technology. The committees will also hear introduction 1328 of uh, 2019 in relation to the identification of languages spoken by callers to the 311 Customer Service Center, sponsored by Council Member Menchaca. This bill would require 311 to implement a protocol for identifying the languages spoken by a telephone caller to 311. As we learned in a private hearing on language access, the process for connecting callers to interpreters is too long too inaccurate and too reliant on the caller lowering at least some English. I look forward to hearing from the panels today and would like to thank the Technology Committee staff, Patrick, Sebastian, and Irene for putting together this hearing. 
I also like to recognize the technology committee members, council members Eric Jaeger and and also members of the Committee on Government Operations, uh, Council Member Powers. Thank you, and I look forward to hearing testimony on 2011 and the bills today. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Ku. Uh, before we uh, go to your testimony, we're gonna have the Committee Council uh, swear the three of you in today. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before these committees and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you. Great, you may begin in whatever order you'd like. And if you could please identify yourself. Good afternoon, Speaker Johnson, Chairman Cabrera, Chairman Ku, and members of the City Council Committees of Governmental Operations and Technology. My name is Joe Morrisro. I am the Executive Director of New York City 311. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on 311 customer experience and operations. With me today are Samir Saini, Commissioner of the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications, known as DOIT, and Dominic Berg, DOIT's Acting Deputy Commissioner for Business, Business Solutions Delivery. I'm honored to serve as the Executive Director of 311 since 2008 and to represent the women and men of the 311 team. Since 2010, 311 reports directly to the Mayor's Office of Operations, an alignment that underscores the importance of the operation and service to the city. Prior to that, 311 reported to DOIT. DOIT continues to provide technology services and general services administration and support for the 311 organization and works collaboratively, collaboratively with 311 and the Mayor's Office on the continual evolution and enhancements to the service delivery and customer experience of 311. As executive director, I oversee all aspects of 311, from the operation of the most familiar component, the call center, to the creation and implementation of multiple customer-facing channels, performance results, and quality control measures, interactions with city agencies, compliance with regulatory requirements, data collection, and most importantly, serving our customers, the millions of residents, thousands of businesses, and numerous visitors and commuters to New York City. The 311 process relies on systems supported by DOIT and partnerships with city agencies to ensure a customer has access to information, assistance, and services through a variety of channels, including the call center, 311 online, text, mobile, and social media. To understand 311 operation and customer experience, it is helpful to understand the flow of 311 service delivery from customer inquiries and requests to the answers provided and the actions taken, as well as the confirmation provided. With few exceptions, public interactions with 311 result in one of the following outcomes. One is a service request, a situation where the city needs to do something. Second is an information request, uh, for example, when is my recycling pickup day? And the third may be a referral to an outside entity, such as the MTA or New York State. Since 311 launched in March 2003, it has received over 275 million calls an additional 89 million customer contacts in our digital channels. Originally launched as a call center, New York City 311 has evolved into the most comprehensive municipal government service platform in the nation. Available 24 seven in 180 languages and multiple channels, 311 received 44 million customer contacts in 2018. On an average day, 311 interacts with over 120,000 customers and for an average month, 311 receives 1.7 million calls and 1.7 million online visits to the companion 311 online website, 172,000 mobile app touches, 19,000 text messages, 23,000 online chats, and serves 1,800 customers on social media, in addition to publishing city programs, information, and services to over 500,000 of our social media followers. For further context on the annual, for, for, sorry, for further context on an annual basis, New York City 311 receives more calls than all other U.S. City 311s combined. The 311 mission is aligned with the administration's goals and vision on equity, and most notably focuses on providing the public with equitable service delivery through quick and easy access to all New York City government services and information, while maintaining the highest possible level of customer service. The 311 team is focused on meeting our customers where they are, 
by providing an array of channel options to contact the city, ranging from robust self-service solutions to outstanding customer service delivered by professional, polite, and well-trained representatives. Over the last eight years, in annual customer satisfaction surveys conducted by the CFI group, 311 ranked equal to or better in delivering customer service than the best contact centers in the private sector, and also far surpasses the best in the government sector. In 2018, 311's aggregate net promoter score, NPS, a leading metric for gauging customer satisfaction across all industries in the US, exceeded the scores of Apple and JetBlue. This outstanding performance reflects the dedication and commitment of the women and men who work at 311 and proudly serve their fellow New Yorkers. It is for these reasons that New York City 311 is the recognized model for service delivery and performance reporting for governments across the nation and around the world who studied the New York City 311 model when considering launching their customer service platforms. Customer experience. Uh, the success of New York City's 311 customer service platform over the years is tied to the ability to evolve and expand the, to meet ever-changing needs. To accomplish this, the 311 organization collaborates with numerous groups to constantly evaluate the current state, receive and respond to feedback that drives improvement, and to partner, and to, partner to design and create new initiatives that better serve the city and our customers. There are many partners involved with the ongoing tuning and enhancing of the 311 platform. A notable list includes the following. The Mayor's Office of Operation for Strategic Direction and Policy, Do It on Technology Initiatives and Production Support, City Agencies for Programmatic and Procedural Information, Elected Officials and Community Boards for Feedback and Insight, Open Government and Open Data Advocates who provide fresh ideas and perspective. We also gain insights from the frontline team at 311. These are the people who understand interactions between New York City and its constituents very well because they do it on a daily basis. Above all, we listen to feedback of customers who contact us every day. The care that goes into providing both the customer service agents and the public with the right information is the same level of attention and detail to make sure the data intake and collection throughout the 311 process is accurate and complete. A few examples of how we have enhanced customer experience based on this criti critical feedback are adding a bike lane as a new category for illegal parking, enhancing our content to include the NYPD's B unit, and adding taxi complaint to the mobile app. Uh, the new 311 system platform. As I'm sure the council is aware, DoIt is leading an effort to deliver a new customer relationship management, CRM, platform to replace 311's 16-year-old system. The main purpose of this project is to completely replace the back-end technology. Although many of these changes will not be visible to the public, a new offering will be customer account management functionality. A customer will be able to build and maintain their own account in the CRM so they can effectively manage their relationship with the city as they choose. Data and performance. Another important aspect of 311 is providing data and performance results that focus on ensuring transparency in city government by making information that might be helpful and relevant to the public accessible and understandable where permitted by law. This effort includes organizing the 311 resources and organization structure to ensure proper collective and cat sorry proper collection and cataloging of information received as well as the data input to the system and do its work in building and maintaining the technology and tools that make the data available. Whether an interaction is performed with the assistance of a 311 representative or the customer self-serves by a 311 online or the 311 mobile app, the same data elements are captured and fed to the business intelligence platform. This is a critical and deliberate consideration that ensures consistency in data fields and lists of values uh, and standardization in structure and formatting necessary for users to access and utilize these data sets and reports. 311 works with city agencies to ensure the most up-to-date information about city services and resources is available and disseminated across the various customer channels. The agency information presented to the customer and the representative follows a plain language standard to promote understanding and clarity. 
The information captured by the system and fed to the agencies and the centralized business intelligence tool is formatted in, in standards that allow cataloging, compilation, and publication. The 311 content management team structures the information for every city service, over 5,000 unique pieces of information, in a way that makes it unique and accessible to users in the call center or with the mobile app and by the business intelligence system. The careful design and regular curating of the content ensures that the information provided to the public is correct and the resultant data is useful, accessible, and understandable for our customers. The 311 Quality Assurance Department further ensures the accuracy and credibility of data by inspecting and measuring the intake process with customers and the data entry process performed by representatives or customers. The quality control step is, a, is vital to the subsequent use of performance results and data. Consumers of 311 data include members of the public, such as residents, business owners, and visitors, as well as city agencies and elected officials. 311 data is available in a variety of options. These include a suite of offerings known as citywide performance reporting, which is managed by DOIT and available and summarized on the Mayor's Office of Operations website on nyc.gov. A sampling of these offerings shows the scope of data sharing and multiple uses of the source data and include NYC Open Data. The NYC Open Data tool managed by DOIT increases the accessibility of public data generated by 311 and various New York City agencies as part of an initiative to improve accessibility, accountability, and transparency in city government. The catalog supplies access to a repository of government produced machine readable data sets. The data sets do not include personally identifying information. Over the past 365 days, there have been 2.8 million page views. The 311 service request map is a visual representation of the location, frequency, and concentration of service requests filed through the 311 system at street or intersection level, as well as by zip code, community board, and city council district. Regarding intro 188, anonymous complaints, while 311 understands the intent of the proposed bill, we believe that what this bill proposes would have two unintended negative consequences. First, property owners could potentially game the system and skirt city code and law requirements by calling in false complaints and then receive immunity for three months. Second, it would impact a, con it would impact a constituent's right to freely report a quality of life issue without fear of retaliation or harm. Customers at such risk by a change to anonymous reporting criteria are many, but two tangible examples are immigrants and tenants. Additionally, council recently passed new, lo new local privacy protection laws that endorse a minimum necessary standard of collection and disclosure of personally identifying information by city agencies, and which underscore the importance of anonymizing such information where appropriate, as would certainly be the case for circumstances involving risk of personal harm. Regarding intro 1328, language access, 311 wholeheartedly agrees with the spirit of the legislation and shares the same passion for providing access to city information and services to those who, who English is not their primary language. In fact, 311 services over 1 million calls in 2018 in languages other than English. For context, on an annual basis, New York City 311 receives more calls in languages other than English than the city of Los Angeles 311 receives total calls for all languages. The proposed law would require 311 to implement a process for identifying non-English speaking customers. Uh, 311 has a process in place with our interpretation services vendor to provide an initial interpreter who will identify the spoken language or dialect of a customer. This is a requirement of the citywide language services contract. The proposed bill would also require that 311 examine every disconnected call and determine the cause of the disconnection. 311 has a robust quality assurance program that reviews calls of all types to ensure the best customer experience for every customer contact. I have spoken to industry leaders in voice recognition and interpretation services, and the consensus was that the technology to support the bill's requirement is not yet available and not expected to be for many years. Finally, on behalf of my colleagues, I thank the speaker, Chairman Cabrera, Chairman Koo, 
and committee members for your time and the opportunity to testify. Before I turn it over for questions, I would like to personally extend an invitation to all members of the committee to visit 311 to see the operations and meet the dedicated city employees on the front lines of customer service. I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Morrisro. Before we go to questions uh, from committee members, I want to acknowledge that uh, we've been joined uh, by Councilmember Powers, uh, Councilmember Maisel, Councilmember Perkins, Councilmember Holden, Councilmember Rodriguez was here, and I want to turn it over to Councilmember Menchaca, uh, who is, uh, as you mentioned, sponsoring a bill that's being heard today, the author of a bill, uh, if he wanted to make some opening remarks on uh, the bill. Thank you, Speaker, and to the chairs, uh, thank you for your testimony. Uh, looking forward to discussing that. I want to just start about, uh, or I want to start with the just sheer fact that we're so all so proud of the work that we do here in New York City to really ensure that we take care of and protect the rights of our immigrants. Um, everyone has the dignity to be heard, and every, every day we're trying to figure out how that can happen in their preferred language. Uh, and we know so many of them are here, alive and well, in our city. Uh, in the interest of making that true for every New Yorker's interaction with the city agencies, we, we passed Local Law 30 in 2017 to guarantee language access for all New Yorkers, making it a requirement for city agencies to provide their services in the 10 uh, of the city's most commonly spoken languages. However, back in October, I held a joint hearing with my colleague, Councilmember Cabrera, the chair of the Government Ops Committee, on this language access requirement to review whether the city agencies were living up to it. Uh, I know your testimony kind of started pointing to some of that, but what we discovered was that many service providers on the ground reported clients who were not attended to by city agencies with proper language access. Yet the city claimed it had never received any complaints on this issue. And so since the complaints for the lack of language access are supposed to be lodged with 311, we received the city's 311 data to see if, uh, we reviewed it to see if a large number of language access complaints were actually filed. However, the data appears to reflect that very few, if any, complaints for language access had been filed. Investigating further, we discovered that the 311 phone system is set up in such a way that the, it hinders the access to language assistance in the following ways. One, when first calling 311, an automated system asks you to select between six languages, not 10, required by Local Law 30 of 2017. If you select one of the six languages, after hearing about alternate side parking in your chosen language, you are connected to an English-speaking operator with no idea that you've selected an option other than English. It can be incredibly frustrating and it requires minimum, uh, some minimum English to attempt to communicate that you need an interpreter that you mentioned in your testimony with a 311 operator. If you select other from the menu of languages, and I'm ha happy that you guys are listening to this because I just want you to see how important so many New Yorkers are going through right now, that once you select other, you are again connected to an English speaking operator with no idea that you've selected an option other than English. If the caller remains on the line long enough to speak with a representative from Language Line, and I, I'm already frustrated reading this, the live interpretation service, it can take another five minutes to determine which interpreter matches the language spoken by the caller if the caller cannot speak any English. Now, you mentioned that you talked to some of the leaders in the industry, and I get that there's a challenge here. Um, this is what it looks like to a New Yorker. So it became clear after attempting several language, uh, different languages with 311 that perhaps the lack of data on language access complaints is not due to the perfect language offered by the agencies, but a faulty 311 protocol that is a barrier to the language, hence the bill. In this, uh, the, uh, intro 1328 would change that by requiring 311 to create a protocol for ensuring that callers have easier access to at least the top 10 languages, if not 20, then requiring 311 to track how many times a call is dropped in the process of determining an individual's preferred language. We have the means to hold the city accountable. And the last thing I wanna say before I hand it back to the speaker is that the mayor and your agencies do not create policy. You are not the policymakers. We are the policymakers. We represent the people. You execute. And so the fact that, that this does not exist out there right now has nothing to do with the fact that we can pass this bill and really force you all in a room to figure this out with the industry and make it happen. That's our job. Thank you so much and looking forward to talking with you.
Uh, thank you, Councilmember Menchaca. So I'm gonna uh, get into the questions right away and I'm gonna try to breeze through them so there's plenty of time for the council members and committee members that are here today. Number one, does 311, uh, does the customer service center, Mr. Morris Rowe, that you uh, mentioned, have enough personnel to handle the volume of phone calls and online inquiries? Do you need more headcount? Do you have enough headcount? Is the exact headcount you have right now sufficient to be responsive in a timely and efficient manner to the over 40 million contacts that come in? Uh, thank you for the question, and uh, yes, it is. We work, you have enough? We, we work with, uh, with the city process to make sure we have the appropriate staff, so yes. You don't need any more staff? Uh, I have a request in for, in the, uh, in the plan, for, in the January plan for some new needs. Um, that's being considered that would be helpful but we handle we meet all of our service level agreements now with the staff that we have in that request you made is it for additional staff it is for additional staff it is for headcount specific to uh, the emerging social media channel so you do need more staff to handle social media yes mm -hmm. okay um, according to the mayor's manager report through and one conducts customer satisfaction surveys how did you conduct your 2018 survey and how often is this survey, a survey of this type, conducted? Okay. Uh, if I can break it into two uh, components, there are two main surveys that are done. First one is uh, through a contract with a vendor called CFI Group Incorporated. They're the industry leader in uh, gauging customer satisfaction. They call it Customer Satisfaction Index. We do an annual survey with them, that, which they created consist of 25 questions and we contact over 750 customers who have called New York City 311 within the prior 48 hours. And their sentiment, their satisfaction is then rated through that survey. CFI then produces the report. In my opening statement, I mentioned that 311 is rated equal to or better than the best in the private sector and those are the results that come out of that particular report. Um, in addition to that, we have a small group within the organization that is proficient and, and familiar with surveys, and we conduct multiple surveys over the course of the year. We group them into quarters, and we do a survey either via a phone call, a robocall, an online survey, a mobile app survey, or a text survey to customers across all of those channels uh, at least four times a year and go through a process which is known as a customer satisfaction survey. Mm -hmm. um, can, can consist of, you know, generally, uh, how, do you, how would you rate something on a scale of, uh, you know, agree, strongly agree, uh, that type of a survey sc uh, scale, a Likert scale, as it's called. Um, and then we also add a question at the end, which is known as the net promoter score survey question, which is essentially, um, how, how satisfied are you with the service? Would you recommend the service to a family member or a friend? That one question at the end, that net promoter score survey, uh, something that the industry uses for customer satisfaction, whether it be you know commercial, private, uh, government, non-government, uh, and it's very effective at being able to ask a single question, engaging someone's result uh, and satisfaction. That's the one that I mentioned earlier. That our results in 2018 in the net promoter net promoter survey score actually passed Apple and JetBlue, who are some of the industry leaders in customer satisfaction. In total, those surveys over the course of 2018. We contacted, we, I'm sorry, we were able to receive responses, survey responses, from over 39,000 New Yorkers. So the mayor's manager report states that the response pool was 796 individuals. That is correct. That's the aforementioned CFI survey uh, that we contact and go through that process. The customer satisfaction the customer survey. Customer satisfaction survey. So that is a negligible, negligible percentage of the annual total number of calls received, which is over 20 million people in calls, as you mentioned in your testimony, do you think that the survey is representative of the pool of 301 callers, given what a minuscule, tiny percentage that is, if you take in 796 individuals? Uh, the uh, the absolute number, as well as the relative number to the to the uh, to the denominator, if you will, uh, don't reflect the. Uh, feedback that we get from CFI, which provides a confidence factor and an accuracy rate. So by sampling over 500, in this case 796, I believe the number was, um, they can use that sample basis, I'm sorry, they can use that number as a sample to represent with a degree of confidence that I believe is plus or minus three percentage points uh, and a degree of confidence that is over 95 percent. So while the number may be small, we do believe it reflects uh, the customer experience with calling New York City 311. Well, I'll just tell you, uh, you'll be happy to hear this. Uh, last week or earlier this week, 
uh, we were preparing for this hearing and when we were talking about some of the language access issues, which I detailed in my opening statement and, and Councilman Menchaca uh, just spoke eloquently about those, putting those to the side, which are very important and we'll get to that, when we did get the um, individual, the operator, on the phone with the translator, uh, a translator that was speaking Russian and translating from the individual here who was asking questions in Russian, the, the person who was speaking English was incredibly thorough. I mean, more thorough than I could possibly believe. The person speaking Russian or Aaron kept saying, okay, thank you for the information, you know, I got it. And then the, the 300 oper operator kept coming back and saying, actually, I have more information. You can go to Best Buy to drop your television off, but it's $50, or you can go. And he kept coming back and back and back with additional information, which I was um, annoyed but impressed by his persistence. Uh, so I thought you would like to hear, I don't know what the gentleman's name was, but he did a very good job and was very, very thorough uh, in uh, communicating that information through the Russian uh, translator and interpreter back to the staff member here who was basically doing uh, the, the, the call just to check on translation services. Um, I want to just jump to uh, some other questions so I can get to my colleagues. I want to, again, just go back to language access. Councilman Machaka said it. I said it in my opening. When a not an English speaker calls 311 and needs an interpreter to make a request, 311 has an automated recording in six languages, as we've said, where a caller can select that language that they want. Yet, if they reach through an operator, the operator's answers are in English, and they don't seem to know what language the caller is speaking in if it's a non-English language caller. If the caller does not know the English word for their language or struggles to communicate it, then the through and one operator has to guess that language. We have a letter here, uh, Brad, if you could give me that letter. So we have a letter here that was submitted uh, for the record uh, from India Home, which is a wonderful uh, nonprofit here in the city that does fantastic work. And uh, they uh, wrote in their letter, they said, our community members have reported unsatisfactory experiences when attempting to access services in 3 on one and forgive me if I, if I mispronounce any of these language dialects wrong, in Canada, Telugu, Jurahadi, Sinhala, and Marathi, just to name a few languages. As such, Stating access is available in 175 to 200 languages is incorrect. In other instances, getting a translator takes too much time and the community member feels helpless and frustrated. Also, getting the proper language translator is another uh, problem. As an example, one of our clients who speaks Telugu was seeking assistance for housing, but did not receive service in his language. Rather, he received a translator for Hindi. Unfortunately, he does not speak Hindi and he could not understand, and the, uh, the, the translator could not understand his needs to the service provider. Finally, the call was disconnected, our client did not receive the service, and we can provide multiple examples that in South Asian adults, uh, the dialect difficulties they're facing when accessing through and one telephon telephonic interpretation services. So what would you say to that? I mentioned it in my opening, Councilman Chaka mentioned it. What would you say on what we need to do to fix that? Well, first, I would say I can uh, empathize with and appreciate the frustration any customer would have uh, in reaching through on one in any language for any, any subject. Um, I frequently listen to calls, so I can make sure I am uh, familiar with the process and understand that. We've been working language access for a long time to try to make it as effective as we can be, as it can be, uh, predating the, the local access law uh, that was previously mentioned. Um, and we work very closely with the two resources that are, are most accessible to us, our own staff who listen, evaluate, and monitor calls on an annual, on regular basis, and also with our vendor, vendor Language Line. Uh, Language Line is the largest translation and, and interpretation services vendor in the country. Uh, I believe they have over 10,000 clients. Um, this is their core business. We really work with them to understand how do we handle the situations that have been described here where a customer may not be able to speak even the, the name of their language in English, how do we get them from that phone call to an interpreter that can help? Uh, the process does work. Uh, we have received calls and languages in many different languages uh, over the course of the year and years. Uh, the process that's set up is 
by design, designed to allow the customer to get through to an agent who in turn can go, who can conference on language line. Language line is required to provide what is known as a triage operator, an, an, uh, an operator on their end who speaks up to five languages and can understand or attempt to understand the language the customer is speaking. But I just want to just quickly, I, I don't want to get too far in this. I, if When we called in and we hit the button for Russian, when the operator picked up, they didn't know that we hit the button for Russian. That is very basic. Why is that the case? Uh, in that case, I'm not familiar. It's very rudimentary. It happens every time. You can do it today. You can call through on one. You can hit the language that you want. Then when the English operator gets on the phone, they ask you the language, and they don't know that you just hit the button for the language that you're requesting. It, is, it doesn't make any sense. I, I don't disagree with you there. It is a limitation of our telephony to our customer relationship management system, how the data is passed. Um, what we do have is when Russian is identified, when we do contact language line, there is an automated process where they can select Russian as the language, so then it goes right to the language line interpreter for Russian. I, just, I don't want to paper over this. It, it, it is sort of unacceptable that today in the most diverse city in the world with hundreds of languages spoken, just on the languages that you accept to push the button on, that the operator doesn't know you push the button on that language. I mean, that's so basic. It should, there's no way to fix that immediately? Uh, I will definitely go back and take a look and see if anything we've tried is, if there's anything else beyond what we've looked at and if there's any other possibility on that. Okay, uh, will the new system upgrade allow the 3 one operator to know if a caller has selected a non-English language? Uh, the new system will focus on the back end of 3 one the, the application itself. Uh, when we have the new system and then subsequently when we upgrade uh, a telephony system, that merger, that, that uh, connection, if you will, will allow us to do that. Um, Councilman Machak, I'm sure, is going to ask about the 10 designated languages, so I'm not going to get to that. He mentioned it in his opening. Uh, I, I just want to uh, end with the uh, uh, mobile app. Why does the mobile app have a small uh, universe of possible complaints compared to, uh, that you can submit on compared to online? Uh, the, Why doesn't it match? Okay. The mobile app offers just about two dozen complaints, so it is less than what's available online and, and certainly what's less than available in the call center. Some of that limitation is due to the current system, the 16-year-old system, in order to be able to build out how to do the intake for some complaints while matching it to a mobile app, while meeting the standards that the mobile app is required for Apple and Google are very limited. Um, so that's one portion of it. The other is it's, it's just a matter of um, resource uh, on the actual app itself. Right? So right now we have a process, the app lists in order with some groupings of the different types of complaint types, such as quality of, of life versus infrastructure. Um, but at some point it would continue to scroll and scroll and scroll if we were allowed to have all of them. And the app doesn't have that current capability, oh, sorry, we don't have the current capability to put that on the app and then be able to receive that through. It's, so, it's not possible to have that capability? Uh, it's something we've not pursued because it would allow you to go down and, and would just list and list and list the number of complaints that are out there. And, and it would not give the orders for customers to be able to scroll through. They would just continue to scroll through X number of... There's no way to design a system that handles this? And this. Uh, I don't think it's a question of designing the system. I think we looked at it from what's the highest demand and being able to provide that out uh, to customers in the mobile app. Do, but is it your belief that the mobile app should match what's available on a web browser, on a computer, on, th on the telephone line? In most cases, I would say yes, um, but not in all cases. Um, there can be different things that you can do on, online that maybe not necessarily something you would do on the mobile app. Uh, our current limitation, though, with the mobile app is tied to our current existing system, uh, since it serves as the backend. So are you building a new system for your mobile app? Uh, the new system that I mentioned, and that we will probably likely talk a little bit more about the new CRM system, is going to give us more flexibility to then redesign the mobile app. So we fix, the, we upgrade the CRM, then we can revisit the mobile app. When, when will that happen? When, uh, when can people expect a new system, a new mobile app that is more flexible? Okay. I will say that the sequence is the new CRM system first, then the mobile app, and I would defer to my colleague. And what's the timeline on that? Uh, I would defer to my colleague, Commissioner Saini, for the timeline on the CRM. Great. Uh, good afternoon. Um, 
the from a timeline standpoint, we're looking at rolling out the um, the new modern uh, platform, CRM platform, and all the components with it uh, by the middle of this year. So we're 80% complete with the solution uh, as of today. Um, what that means is we've completed the design phase, which is sort of the, uh, the initial phase uh, along the software development lifecycle. We've completed the build phase, um, which is, me means all the development and the coding and configuration of, um, of the solution. And we are now in the middle of the testing phase. Um, so we're 80% there. We got 20% left. We're going to go live in the middle of the year. Great. Um, Okay, I think uh, that's all the questions I have. Uh, I would hope, Commissioner uh, and Director, that uh, as you all start to um, finish with that 20%, given this hearing today, given the feedback you're going to receive from the public and from folks that have had issues with 3-in-1, uh, given feedback that council members will have, uh, given the experience we hear from our constituents and the experience our staff has had through with one, that there will be a meaningful way for you to include and be open to some of the ideas and feedback that we have as you begin to uh, migrate over and upgrade into a new system beyond the 2003 system. So can we look forward to that type of partnership and working together? Uh, yes, we certainly can. Great. Absolutely. Thank you very much. I want to turn it over to Chair Cabrera. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I want to follow up uh, with something that uh, the speaker mentioned in his opening remarks. Uh, regarding Washington, D.C., they have uh, video capability. I, will the new system have uh, that option? Uh, video capability to... Um, to so be able to video? see you on the screen, you'll be able to see the operator. Oh. And there's a, there's a reason why I'm asking this yeah. question in front of yeah. Um, I'm not sure I can answer all of that, but I can definitely address the second part you just mentioned, that uh, it will not have the ability, the new system will not give us the ability for a customer to use their smartphone and see or interact visually with the, with the customer service agent. That's not capability that's being built in the new CRM. Is there a particular reason why uh, that was not implemented? I don't know if there was a particular reason why it was not, no. Okay, uh, let me give you the reason why I think it makes sense. Uh, we all been discussing here so far, uh, dealing with the language access uh, dilemma that we have. And, it, and it's not an easy, it's not an easy uh, situation, but if I go to most of our immigrants, uh, uh, they go to a nonprofit, uh, and many of them, they're given a car, uh, to be able to say, hey, this is the language that I speak, they will easily, it will make it easier for your operator to quickly uh, be able to direct uh, the caller to an uh, interpreter. Uh, do you see uh, that as an added value? Uh, I would certainly see that as an added value from both a customer's perspective as well as customer service delivery professionals would have a bit, that would be a benefit for sure. Uh, and I just want to comment yeah, on please. that as well. From a, from a technology perspective, uh, knowing what, plat what modern platform we're moving to, I can tell you that's a capability that we, we, would, have, we would have that ability uh, to deploy that feature uh, if, we, if, we, if we wanted to. We'll have that ability. In the current, current platform, it would be impossible. Uh, but in the new platform, yes. And the new one, uh, is, is it, what would it take to go to the next level? Is it funding, uh, and if it is, how much more? So, so the, uh, I think Joe already mentioned, the, the priority right now is to, is to migrate off of this legacy 16-year-old, highly customized Siebel on-prem application, right, to the new uh, the new platform, um, which again will be deployed in the middle of the year. Once that's done, there's already a queue of enhancements, right, and features um, that we've already received um, from numerous sources um, that um, we want to quickly roll up our sleeves and start deploying um, on an iterative, uh, in an iterative way, in a routine in routine cycles 
um, into production. I think the, the, the question, the thing that, that Joe and myself and others uh, are working on right now is how do we prioritize the list, uh, which will be ever-growing list <laughs> of enhancements that um, uh, New Yorkers, uh, the, counts, uh, the city council, uh, 311, uh, and others seek right, to deploy uh, in a way that makes everyone happy, um, uh, but also in a way where um, we can deploy these things quickly um, and uh, on, a, on a continuous basis. So. You know, I would think uh, not only for 311, I don't know if you have relationships with the people or PSAC and uh, dealing with 911. Imagine a 911 call, you're able to see hmm. that person in their condition. Uh, if they're not able to speak, but you see their condition, you're able to more quickly assess the situation. Sure. Uh, and I would think that this will be a priority uh, for 311, uh, and I appreciate uh, that uh, what you just mentioned right now was a priority uh, for us in the council. This is a priority uh, for people to be able to have access to the language. I have to tell you, I just mm -hmm. call <laughs> uh, about a situation. I won't mention what the situation was. Uh, because I'm going to leave it for the next hearing. Uh, but it was a bit frustrating, my experience. I had not called 311 in a long time. Uh, and it, it, first you say it's going to take 40-something seconds uh, before I talk to an operator. I said, all right. And it just, you know, then going through all those languages, you know, I just, it, it was, uh, it was a bit frustrating, and that least. So let me just close this loop of questioning. So can can we expect uh, after this summer, uh, when you have the veiling out the new system, uh, to make the video option a priority? Uh, I think, as the commissioner said, we have a number of items that would be after we go live after this summer. Um, they would all have to be assessed and understood and. and kind of a combination of prioritization of need, but also ability. Some, some could be done faster than others, perhaps. What would be more important than this? I'm just curious. Uh, what would be some of the other items uh, that the, you have in the pipeline? Off the top of my head, I, I, don't, I don't have a list of those items, okay. nor would I be able to do a comparison in real time. But I can appreciate yeah. the request and something that we would consider. So I, I, I can share what one I think we already described, which is the new mobile app. OK. Right, and, and all the features that we want to deploy there. Um, again, just to clarify, when we go live in the middle of this year with, with the new platform, the new CRM platform, the, um, we'll have overhauled the back end. The current 301 mobile app will, will still remain. Uh, and that's on purpose, because we want to make sure there's no disruption right, in, gotcha. in current um, uh, New Yorkers using the, the current 301 app. Uh, in parallel, we are working on developing the new mobile app that will work with the new platform. Uh, and that, I think, is, that is certainly going to be a major priority right, for us um, post um, the shift right, to the new platform. I, I used to be the chair of technology so many moons ago uh, and, and right here in the council. And I was uh, pretty impressed uh, with Duet's ability to handle multiple projects at the same time. So if you're dealing, you know where I'm going with this, uh, if you can, you, don't you have the ability to be able to handle the app plus the video at the same time? Oh, and or uh, be able to license, uh, uh, you know, to whoever, the vendor that is providing Washington DC, why not, instead of recreating, you know, sure. this world, why not just incorporate that? Sure, so, so I'll, I'll say this, uh, it absolutely noted, uh, two two way video chat right for a uh, three one one session right will be added to the list right of enhancements that we have. Um, we'll do our best right to uh, do what do it does best, which is everything at once yes. um, for multiple agencies. Um, and uh, from there, we'll we'll see where it goes. Okay, thank you. Great. Just. Uh, just do it. No, just kidding. <laughs> uh, so let me go to a couple of quick questions, and then I'm going to uh, pass it on to my co-chair. Uh, uh, Councilmember Menchaca mentioned that, uh, and as anybody who will go in 311 and go through the whole list, right now we have six languages. The law requires 10. There's a particular reason why we're not up to 10. Is it the system? What, what, what's holding? Oh. 
Um, well, I believe we are covering the 10. The access to up to 180 languages uh, is designed to be able to reach, obviously, more than six and more than 10. The uh, six that have been mentioned are what we call the automated system. The upfront, it's known as an IVR, um, stands for Integrated Voice Response Unit. Um, that was designed based on demand, not on adhering to a, a number of six or 10, et cetera. Um, it's also limited by the number of time, number of prompts you can actually press. Um, but the, the satisfying the 10 languages is done by offering up to 180 languages. Uh, my last question, uh, and that is, uh, as, as the speaker was asking, if you go down, you're listening to the, so different language, the options, the automated one, you press that button, uh, and then it goes to an English speaker. Well, I, I'm a little confused. Right? You know, somebody calls my office and press two, uh, and you know, if you speak Spanish, uh, for example, and it takes you to a different phone number, right? Why not just assign uh, the interpreter uh, who speaks Russian, why doesn't it go directly there? I just didn't catch why. Right. It sounds like rather simple, right, thing to do. I, I, I agree it sounds like a simple thing to do. Um, alas, it is not in our current system. Our telephony system and our CRM system are both aged, as we've mentioned a few times. There's a technology interface between the two. It's, I don't want to get too deep, but no, it's no, I appreciate that. CTI. Um, we need upgrades on both ends in order for that data stream, that data information to be able to be passed along with the call. That data doesn't get passed today. But you will have that in your new technology, right? The, the new CRM technology gives right. us one piece of that. We still will need it on the telephony side. What, what was that? The, the, the new CRM will give us one piece of that technology. There's another piece, which is called uh, the telephone system, for lack of a better word. Right. We need to add it to that as well. We need added capability on that. And that will come out online this summer, too, to be able to have uh, that? No, that, that's a different project and a different time. That's an, a different time. So that's another one in your list of priorities. That's that will be a priority as well. Okay. Thank you so much. Very informative. Well, with that, I'm going to pass it on to council member, my colleague, and our co-chair, uh, Peter Koo. Thank you, uh, Chair Cabrera. Yeah. Thank you for all coming. Yeah, I know it's a long day. Yeah. So one of the goals uh, of the new replacement system for the old system is to have more customer-oriented, cost-effective system that offers communications between city staff and customers through uh, different channels of commu communications. So how does the current contract with IBM address these issues? We'll talk about channels first. Um, I, I'll start and then I'll ask my, my colleague, yeah. Commissioner, to, to weigh in. Um, we agree with your, your statement in that it will provide more customer access. Uh, yeah. We'll continue, I shouldn't say provide more, we'll continue to provide access to the customers, which is, is a main part of our mission and our goal. Um, we do have the current system. We've been able to build out channels such as online, mobile, text, et cetera. They're not all integrated, uh, which makes it challenging. One of the things the new system will do is allow us to have better integration. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll defer to my colleague to discuss the IBM contract. That's right. So, so in short, the IBM contract is primarily mm -hmm. the um, uh, leveraging their expertise as a system integrator to uh, transition us from the legacy Siebel platform, right, to the new um, Microsoft Dynamics platform. Um, it doesn't include uh, scope of work uh, uh, around new channels or new, new features that we have in the queue that we want to deploy. We'd have to actually, uh, we will be figuring out um, our resource plan for post uh, IBM um, uh, internally how we are going to manage uh, deploying these new features and new channels um, uh, by ourselves. Hmm. Um, so again, IBM contract is just to get onto the new platform. Um, all new features we're going to be handling um, internally by ourselves or with a, a new system integrator that can help us so we can move faster. So with the data from the old system uh, be transferred to the new system? Absolutely. There'll be no data loss. Uh, it'll be a seamless transition. 
um, from the old to the new. So oh, we, are, we, are, we want to acknowledge that we, are, uh, we have Council Member Lander and Kalos here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. So, so what are the new features the uh, 311 will offer customers? Um, the main new feature, again, we've, we've talked a lot about enhancing the back end and being uh, you know, an upgrade there, but the main new feature will be the introduction of customer account management. So today, um, and I think the speaker uh, mentioned this in his opening uh, as well, you can't manage your relationship with the city by building your own account. Um, this is something that is obviously beneficial to customers. Uh, it would also be beneficial to the city to allow customers to do that. So the, the new technology gives us that capability. Customers will be able to opt in, uh, be able to build how they want. Do they want to get track of this service? Do they want to keep track of that service? Do they want to keep track of their service requests? They can do all of that themselves um, and as they define it. So that's a major change for 311, and that's what the new, one of the things the new system will provide. So that's only for online, though, right? Eh? Uh, it would be done online, yes. Yeah, exactly, um, but when you call, they don't. How can you get a, a set of account right. information? So if you call, we have the ability to look up your previous uh, requests, your your previous uh, complaints, if you will, and get status. So you'll always have that capability. But to build your own account and to keep in mind privacy, obviously, um, we're looking at that as something that would be available to the customer online. Mm. So would the customers be able to upload pictures or videos to support the campaigns? Uh, yeah, in some cases, customers can upload pictures and videos today to support their complaints, and we would continue where that exists. On, on the new system, yeah. Yes. But uh, would, would there be limitations? They, uh, is the file is too big, you can upload or what? Uh, um, I believe there might be a file limitation size. I'm not. I'm not proficient on that, so I don't know if uh, my colleagues could assist with um, providing some context on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't believe there would be a technical limit, significant technical limitations, right, um, uh, for adding multimedia features, right, um, uh, into the new platform. I think the real question will be from a business perspective mm. and from an agency perspective whether uh, those agencies are seeking um, uh, to allow uh, and support multimedia, right, um, to be uploaded along with a service request. But it won't be a technology issue, it's really just a business decision. Okay. So, uh, uh, according to the request for systems integration service, the city plans to use the new system to offer uh, these services uh, through text, chat, and social media. So how does the current contract with IBM address the implementation of such channels? Can we do a text now, no, right? Um, I can answer some of that. So the contract is to build out the current system. Uh, our ability to then integrate, say, the text channel um, already exists to an extent. Our 301 operators receive a text, they access the current system, and they get answers and they text the customer back. That will continue in the new system. They'll still be able to access it and provide answers. Further down the line, I don't have details, but further down the line, we can even further integrate that uh, through the telephony system and the CRM system. But what exists today, at a minimum, will continue tomorrow, mm. or continue in the future state. Yeah, so, so, um, so if customers uh, are going to be able to sell accounts online, right? Uh, what personal information will be required uh, to set up the account? Uh, whatever is necessary to set up the account will be in strict compliance with privacy laws, whatever privacy laws exist. Just name and phone number? Yeah, I, I, don't, I, wouldn't make a, Email. I wouldn't want to make a blanket statement uh, without going through it, but, but clearly there'll be a requirement that, that PII and privacy law is, is paramount in setting up an account. But, but what about some customers, they don't want to set up, they can they remain anonymous? Uh, well, in many cases, customers can remain anonymous when they're filing a complaint, yes. Yeah. So I have one more question, this is on, on the translation, right? When you go online, suppose you want to do um, Chinese or Korean, right? Uh, on my staff do it in Korean, uh, she want to report a, a cloud catch basin. 
but the uh, but the translation uh, is not that good. Uh, catch basin uh, is translated as go catch the lateral depression. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So you no, know, I know there are limitations on translation. I don't know what what you service you. You probably use Google translation or what? Uh, yes, uh, for for online, um, in both in terms of uh, adhering to the language access law, but yeah. also to serve our customers, we've consistently looked at what's the best available tool out there. Yeah. Um, and while I can appreciate the, the customer's yeah, so frustration. How you, uh, this one, right? Right. So how, how do we you improve on that? Because this is a, a big complaint in my neighborhood. Sure. Yeah. Um, Catch patients are clogged, you know, they are not draining. Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the opportunities we have is the tool that we use, which I'll say is used kind of gover many governments, many businesses use, is Google Translate. I think a way to improve that. I think, uh, Commissioner, you may have a sense of that better than I do. Sure. So, um, uh, again, Google Google Translate is the primary uh. translation uh, engine right, that we use online. It's used in the private sector. Uh, it's used in the public sector. It's considered one of the best out there. Uh, to answer your question about how this would get better, the good news about Google Translate is the underlining technology behind it, which leverages artificial intelligence and machine learning and natural language processing, um, uh, means, all that means, that it gets better over time exponentially. Yeah. So for any deficiencies we see in translations today, uh, I have a high confidence that those things will only get better over time because of the, the, the kind of technology Google's using for their translation engine. So uh, would the mobile app have a multiple language uh, option allowing a customer to submit complaints in different languages? But now it is only in English, right? Yeah, so right now it is only in English. Uh, and again, we, we're faced with some of the same challenges that uh, we uh, looking at what tools out there could exist to do translation. Um, so it's something that uh, we recognize the need for and would have to address as we go forward. Are you going to do the like mobile app in other like uh, popular languages? I, I think what we would look at is what can we do yeah. in, in that area uh, once, once, we, once we're at that stage. So uh, my last question here, before I go to council members, according to uh, New York City 311 IBM task uh, order, the post production period is only 12 months. What will happen after this period, this period ends? Uh, would the city need to re-enter into a contract with IBM uh, for additional support? Yeah, I can, I can answer that question. So. Um, uh, do it will be uh, taking over um, production support right for the new platform um, after uh, IBM um, finishes right their work um, uh, as outlined in the contract um, so we do not see an extension right of IBM um, or, or seeking IBM to provide production support on an ongoing basis that will all be done in-house by do it resources um, part of that involves retraining our current um, uh, uh, resources that support this, the current Siebel platform onto the new technologies that we're, uh, we're, we're uh, gonna be deploying very soon. So you don't need like, any like, uh, contract to support uh, post production? After the, after, the, after the 12 months, yeah. we'll, at that point, we'll be in a position to handle support uh, on an ongoing basis internally with Do It Resources. Okay. okay. Uh, Councilmember Kalos, you want to ask questions? I want to thank our chairs uh, Cabrera and Ku, and in particular Councilmember uh, Carlos Menchaca and his trust for me. I have one question that I have been following up with. Uh, 311, Joe Morris Rowe, I, I'm a big fan of yours and what your operators do. Uh, if I click Homeless Outreach Assistance, it's my most frequent request in my district, uh, and the person doesn't have an address because they're homeless, it creates a GPS address, but I can't drag and drop to where they are. Can you please fix it so that everyone making a 301 request can just drag and drop onto the map? Yep, so I, I can answer that. So um, uh, the, the feature to uh, drag uh, your finger and drop a pin, right, uh, to determine your location versus putting an address will be a priority feature that will be deployed in the initial rollout of the new app 
which will be after we we deploy the new the new platform. Uh, totally recognize um, the uh, the advantage right of of that feature. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Councilmember Menchaca. I want to thank uh, Councilmember Ben Kalos for keeping his word, and uh, our chairs. Um, it's important. It's really important. So I want to say um, uh, thank you again for, for engaging us. And clearly, there's, there's a lot of uh, excitement here to make this better. And that's really where this is coming from. Uh, the speaker spoke to some of the pieces that I was going to ask. So I'm going to ask a little bit of a deeper question uh, regarding the 10 designated languages um, related to our law, our access law. And really thinking about languages that are supposed to be covered, yet our telephone automated recording only offers the six languages as options. Um, and uh, I don't know if you answered it before, but I want to get you on the record to ask this. Will you be expanding it to cover all 10 languages? Um, so if I could ask a clarifying question, We're expanding the automated messaging? Is that yes, um, as part of our local lo local access right. so, law. Okay. So as part of the local law, the availability of the 10 languages is covered under the umbrella of the 180 languages of language line. Whether we do or don't have the six languages in the IVR system, every language, all, the 10 languages and more, are available to meet the language access needs. The languages in the IVR system were, are built and sequenced based on volume, and they're designed to be able to help the system move through efficiently. Um, well, and just uh, get, get a sense. So essentially you're saying that it's at six because the volume is at six? Is that, uh, is that what I'm hearing? It, it's at six because initially there were six languages. It turned out in the- Before the law, correct. and now there's 10. Correct, and then the volume though aligns with those six languages. There's a significant drop offs between language number, not English speaking language number one and number two. Yeah. And then significant drop off between number four and number five and then right. further on down. Um, the other limitation is actually a practical matter. Um, because there's only a certain number of prompts and you can't pr hit one zero as a prompt. There are limits right there. Um, got it, got it. Okay, well, but it doesn't mean that it's not possible. And so what I'm hearing from you, just so we can, I wanna get to a couple other questions. You're saying there are some, there are some limits to the technology and how we can kind of get to 10. We have six, there's drop off. Um, I think we, we've been clear that the drop-off is not necessarily because there's just not people speaking X language. It's because people are frustrated and they're going to call back. That relationship I just talked about is very important. And we lose them almost immediately from their first initial experience. That's how customers are. They go somewhere else. Uh, they're not going to come back to the one one So I really do hope that, that we can work with you on 10. Um, and I'm just not, I'm not hearing a no. I just want to get a clarity. Can we get to 10? Is there a plan we can work together? Um, um, we, I can commit that we can work together. We okay. can look at understanding what what we can do. I, I will say it may not be capable until, uh, it won't be capable until we've upgraded both the CRM system and then look at our telephony system as well. I mentioned they're separate. Yeah. So the example of not carrying the fact that someone pressed yeah. the number. Right, and that's, that was, that was my next question. Because right. I want to see if you can explain that a little bit in, in, in depth. Uh, when the non-English speaker selects a language and hears the message in their own language, they are then transferred to an English-only natural language interactive voice, the IVR system you just mentioned, before they can reach an operator. Um, but if they have already indicated that they do not speak English, why are they then being sent to that English-only system? So can you, can you explain that, that piece and that send-off? Uh, yeah, I think it's the, mat the way it's currently set up in the sequence, um, anyone who either goes through the language option or doesn't choose to go through a language option and just waits has to get routed back to that same point before it's passed off to the agent. Um, so it's, a, it's an endpoint whether you speak English or not, or a language other than English, uh, that you land there and you get asked the question again, then you get transferred, or get connected, I should say, um, to the agent who will then be able to service you or bring on language line to service you. Got it. And, and so we clearly see that as a problem. And is there, is there a commitment to kind of look at that flow and just find another flow that prevents that additional step? Yes, I can, I can say that it's something we've looked at over quite a few years. Okay, so this is not a new problem for you? No, it's something we've been trying in, in the full scope of language access and the sequence of how customers go through combined with how much 
the system, the telephone, I call it telephony, the telephone system can actually process. Um, 311 receives 55,000 calls on an average day basis. Um, if it snows, we could have 250,000 calls. There's a processing element to those calls that could, uh, for lack of a better description, uh, you know, kind of clog yeah. things. So a lot of the design is looking at just that. That said, when it comes to language access, I fully appreciate and can empathize with a customer who you know, doesn't understand the language that they're hearing and needs to reach someone. Uh, we've talked a lot with Language Line, who I've mentioned a few times, um, and take a lot of what they give us as counsel. Their direction has been, we've, we've been able to take their direction and their suggestions into this flow that you currently experience. So while I don't, while I recognize it's not satisfactory to some customers, um, it has been enhanced and it's one of the things that Language Lines advises is, you know, have it there, the customer will stay on the line. If you can say, please hold or ask for the, ask for the language, it allows a communication to happen, even if it's in a language you don't understand, while we're trying to get to that triage operator. So we've been looking at the technical flow of this as well as the process flow of this for several years. Um, and it's a challenge. Um, you know, we have our commitment to try to work and, and improve it wherever we can. Got it. Okay. Well, that's something. And, and we're going to follow up on that. And I want, I want to spend some time thinking about that with you. Um, but I will remind you what I said earlier, that we, we, we set the policy for your execution. And so this law is really in that, in that vein, a, a, an opportunity for us to set that goalpost. And right now, the goalpost is based out of, I don't know what it is, but it's not based out of law. And so the law gets us there. And that's why we, we're here talking about this. So can you just please describe the training 311 operators receive on handling calls uh, where the caller needs an interpreter? Just give us a sense about the, that training. And are you aware of any existing software that would automatically detect a caller's language? Um, have you explored adopting any of the software? Uh, great, I can address all of that. Uh, I'll talk to training, uh, both broadly as well as then specifically with, with language. Um, so for a new hire employee, uh, which is through a civil service list process, um, the training consists of uh, initially four weeks of classroom training. We call it exper experiential training, where they're actually working on the system and doing uh, role play and customer service skills rather than using a manual or a binder or something to that effect. Um, it's very immersive over the four four week period, and it's really focuses the agent to be able to handle any call, uh, whether it be an English call, whether it be a non English language call, whether it be something that is transferred to 911 because it's an emergency, or whether it's a service request or an information request. So the training is comprehensive. Um, for language for English, I'm sorry for languages other than English. There is a little extra training that goes into it. Uh, I mentioned before, we work with Language Line quite a bit uh, to get some of their best practices. Again, they have 10,000 clients around the world. Um, they, this is their business. They can share a lot of that with us. So we focus in on what tips they may have given us uh, and in turn do that with the agents. So that's, that's the starting point for training. But and my trainers would appreciate me saying this, training doesn't end after four weeks. It continues. Uh, so we have. We have a quality assurance program and a customer experience program which provides ongoing uh, coaching and developing of all agents. One of the things we can do if a problem occurs, uh, either with a new program that maybe we don't have, you know, we're not communicating correctly, or if an agent is struggling on a particular type of call or a particular type of condition, uh, we have staff. We have professional staff that can coach that agent through a variety of means. We have ability to monitor those calls. We also have a customer experience team that will actually document what we call the customer journey map. So they can see where the pain points may be in trying to one, reach 311, but two, also even understand the information that we're providing. So we really surround the agent with as many tools and as much support as we can, uh, both structured, but also somewhat unstructured in order to be able to answer those, to be able to be well-trained and be able to serve the public. What about the software? Uh, automatically detecting a caller's language. So we've done a lot of work with um, a vendor known as Nuance. Um, they're the industry leader in what's known as natural language understanding. Uh, think of it as interactive speech. Um, we have two natural language understanding applications already in our system, one for English speakers, one for Spanish speakers. Uh, we asked them the question about language identification software. 
the, uh, the consensus um, is that there may be items where you can submit text and it can be deciphered as to what language that is. So when I say text, an image of text, you know, a, a card or a picture as, as uh, Chairman uh, Cabrera had mentioned earlier. Um, but that's not available in real time as far as identifying the language. As far as real time understanding of deciphering what a customer is saying and, and figuring out what language that is, uh, both Nuance and the aforementioned language line uh, have told us that is not something that they currently have or is offering and didn't have a uh, foreseeable future time frame for it. Got it. Okay, so that's going to be exciting for us to kind of think about it and explore with you and learn, uh, help us understand that too. Uh, and I want to follow up with you on that. The, the bill itself, 1328, would require to keep records of calls that get disconnected due to a language barrier sure, issue. Do you already keep any records of that kind? Um, once a, if a record is dropped or disconnected, it exits our system and there's no tracking, uh, no processing or tracking of it at that point. Um, at, a, at a level of performance measurements, performance metrics, we know what percent of calls fall into that category. Uh, and we may Into the language uh, issue. We know it for English speaking, uh, for customers who use the English speaking option and for customers who use the previously mentioned language IVR, we know it for that as well. Got it. So it's kind of, it sounds a little blunt. It, it, it's like a blunt. It, it's not giving you kind of uh, texture data. It's just saying, okay, so someone who went on this route dropped, and we don't know why, but but that's the data that you have right now. Uh, that's the data that we have now, yes. Okay, cool. The bill, I think, is a little bit different, and yes. and so that's what the bill would, would, would require. How much does a 311 caller make, uh, caller, uh, operator um, make? Uh, I don't know the answer off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. There is an entry level. It's a civil service position. Yeah. It's known as a. Can you get that? I'm just kind of curious. Right. Oh sure, team. we could. We can. I I I, I can get that. I okay. Cool. Wouldn't want to quote it without knowing. I will say the uh, 301 agent is known as a is a civil service title. It's called call center representative. Um, so. Right on. But Thank I, you. I can get you the the salary for that. Thank you so much, Chair, for generous time. Chair Cabrera, you have further questions? Okay. Councilman Yeager. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and Mr. Chairman, I'm privileged to serve on both committees with you. Uh, I apologize if you asked this while I stepped out of the chamber for a few seconds. Uh, um, does the caller ID function populate any fields for uh, record keeping when somebody calls into 311? Um, when someone calls 311, the caller ID is captured, um, but it is not, and, and it is, but it's not something that is shared. Okay, so uh, to, to uh, Councilman Menchaca's uh, point and on his legislation of trying to go back and try to figure out how calls get dropped, are you able to save that? And I'm not saying share it with me, I don't, I don't need it, but are you able to keep that information somehow and then go backwards and track what happened if that call gets dropped? Uh, if for the most part, no. Um, we are so 911, when you call, uh, they get your number, they get your name, that it, the number matches to if it's available, the address, et cetera, a map. You know, I'm, obviously they have more important things to do than the calls that come to 311, but the technology's there, isn't it? Um, I, I understand what you're saying with respect to describing the 911. I, I don't know it personally. Um, for us, it's a matter of, um, the amount of data that we process if a call, if currently if a call drops, while there would be a caller ID associated with that, we don't have um, reports that go through and pull those individual calls. Well, why don't just, you have, what, what would be so difficult about, I'm not saying turn it on tomorrow, I know it's not a switch, but right. how complicated can it possibly be to, a call comes in, a number pops up on the screen, if the call drops, something populates a, a record and says call dropped, then move on, everybody goes on about the day. I, I will, I, I don't know, and I will okay. go back and take I'm a not as smart as Councilman Kalos, and he has a lot of technological things he's probably showing you, and uh, you know, you should get him to go over and help you guys because he's good on the tech stuff. But my point is that some of these things that, and I think, I think the speaker made this point, I think uh, Councilman Menchaca made this point, some of the things that we're talking about seem to perhaps to novices is kind of easy, and then you say, well, you know, we, our systems can't do that, and and we sit here and listen and go, well, okay, they can't do that. We don't, we think you're truthful. We know you're truthful. We don't think you're misleading us, but why can't they? I mean, if, if I were to call my credit card company and um, they 
they, uh, they match my number, they ask me to punch in the last four digits of my social security number, and by the time I get to a representative, without me ever having to put in my account number, they already know who I am, and I've verified myself to them. That's, that's available technology. It doesn't only belong to the bank. Uh, agree, okay. and uh, that large part of the reason that doesn't exist today is because we don't capture customer information. We don't build customer account information as the example you just Right, described. maybe we should. Well, in the future CRM um, system that we've talked about, right. the customer will have the ability to build their own account uh, if they so choose to have that known to us when they call, as opposed to just going online, we could start to do that. Why do we want it to be up to the customer and not up to the city of New York? Um, in large part, just uh, focus on customer privacy and being able to have the customer but be able to make that But aren't we more concerned with, it's a government telephone. It belongs to the government, it belongs to the people. Do we believe that, I mean, 911 isn't anonymous. They, they record the telephone number. Why do we think that, I mean, if somebody calls my office and doesn't give their name and number, there's nothing I could do for them. Uh, why would we think that we don't want that information to be maintained? What privacy concern are we, I'm not saying take the number, put it in the newspaper, but what privacy concern do we have? Uh, from my perspective, the privacy concern is being able to uh, allow customers to feel comfortable that they can call New York City 311 and not have uh, that information be taken from them or, or to have to provide that information. The idea of being able to remain anonymous has been something from the start of 3-on-1, and I think it's served 3-on-1 and the city well, that fe people feel comfortable that, um, they don't, that they're not being tracked, if you will. Well, there's a level of anonymity that comes with simply uh, not, you know, you, you, can, you can tell the operator, I want this to be an anonymous call, but not keeping the information that is it actually br being brought in. I'm not saying delve deep and say, can you give me your address, can you give me your date of birth, but I'm saying keeping the information that you're already getting doesn't violate any sort of uh, privacy uh, right, in my view, uh, okay. being deliberately uh, set up as an anonymous system unless somebody chooses to opt in to not being anonymous, I don't think is necessary. It's, it's the government, right? Okay, okay. all right. Um, I'm not asking you to agree with that, okay. I'm just making my point. I have a question about your opposition to introduction 188 and um, that property owners could potentially game the system and skirt city code and law requirements by calling in false complaints and then receiving immunity for three months. I think the point of that sentence is that the property owner would call in complaints on themselves and then therefore uh, kind of have this three month period that nobody can come and look at them? Uh, that, that is a scenario that could happen, yes. Okay, let me ask you a question. Have you had any conversations with anybody in the council about this bill prior to today? Uh, no, I have not. Okay, the sponsor of the bill? Uh, no, no, none of the council I, here? No, I know who the, the bill was introduced is. here in the council on, I want to get the date right, because I like to speak. Uh, does he have something to tell Yeah, me? I'm sorry, I, I, can I amend that answer? Sure, please. Um, I have not had conversation with anyone. My understanding is uh, the representatives of the city have had conversations with Council Member Matteo okay. on this particular As, And the bill remains the same. The bill was introduced on January 31st of 2018, about a year ago. So you've had conversations with, uh, with Leader Matteo and uh, the bill hasn't changed. So you're here with your objections today. Um, and the objection is in essence that the, well, it's what we discussed, the freely report a quality of life issue without fear of retaliation or other harm. I mean, I, I don't think, you know, even anonymous complaints uh, uh, are, would classify as, as a harassment case, so there's no retaliation issue if the complaint is anonymous. And even if you were to record the information of who's calling, it's not necessarily available to, uh, to anybody else. And in fact, if you were foiled for that, uh, it would be an unwarranted, in my view, I, if I was the recipient of a FOIL request and I worked for you, I would respond and say that that would be an unwarranted invasion of personal privacy and not subject to the FOIL law. So I don't think that your objection in paragraph two is necessarily uh, noteworthy for the sponsor to amend the bill accordingly. And with respect to the first paragraph where you uh, indicated the gaming of the system is a concern of yours, I would just say I'd like to roll the dice here and see if that really happens. Um, 
Our concern, as you know, is uh, we just came off a several month debate uh, here in the council and we just passed a bill uh, last week with regard to the signs, right? Now we all know what happened there. Um, uh, some, some fine people decided to make complaints, we believe, about the signs and then the Department of Buildings sent out their troopers and their troopers uh, came pounding through the neighborhood and wrote everybody up. Now, was that smart of the Department of Buildings? No, it was dumb. Uh, they should have used their discretion uh, to decide whether or not something was necessary for a violation. But the first fail, of course, was the 311 system not recognizing that, wow, all of a sudden in Bay Ridge, the signs are just like all the people just hung up signs all over the place. And you guys don't know that because you're not tracking it. Uh, I think the notion of some kind of harassment prevention tool, I actually don't think this bill goes far enough. I'd like it to be a crime. If somebody calls in a false complaint to 311, I'd like it to be a crime. They should be found, they should be prosecuted because they're abusing the tools that we as taxpayers have created. I'm only in office for a year, so I'd like to consider all the taxes I paid prior to last year as having built 311 when Mayor Bloomberg created this. It was a very smart investment in the future of our city. And we created this not so that it can be used to harass people. So when Lita Matteo proposed this bill back in January, right at the beginning of this session at the council, it's not something that he you know, had this epiphany he dreamt of. This is a problem that's been going on in neighborhoods all across the city, people using you to harass. They're using your office, they're using our tax dollars. We should be in a position where we're tracking that, where we're preventing it, and where we're doing it in a proactive way to make sure that people's lives aren't being made miserable by the government that they pay for. So I would encourage you to uh, revisit your objections to intro 188. I think it's a valid bill and that's why I joined my colleagues in supporting it. And uh, I had one other note here, but I don't remember why I wrote it. So excuse me for a second. No, I asked it. Okay, very good. I don't prepare in that much in advance with written stuff. So I just come here and do it on the fly. But I really appreciate your time. I, I recognize, by the way, and I wanna say this publicly and uh, with uh, gratitude to the chairs for giving me this time and indulging me. Um, I, I don't want my words to come off as a criticism of 311 to the system it is today. When Mayor Bloomberg created this, it was visionary, it was revolutionary. Uh, Mayor de Blasio has expanded it uh, in, again, a visionary and revolutionary way. I know Los Angeles, you mentioned, has it. I didn't know that, but it didn't then. Uh, we were the first, if I know, uh, if I remember, and we do it the best. And yes, we get more calls than Los Angeles, but we're better than them, and so we can handle it. But 311 is, today, it is such an important tool. I was on a community board for 18 years, so I was there prior to 311 and through its uh, creation and to the point today where our, our community boards know that it's almost just as easy to go to 311 with a complaint that they receive from a neighborhood resident than to go through internal channels because this way we get the tracking number and we can kind of watch it through the system and then we can you know cry about it when some city agency, not you, doesn't do its job, which is what always happens. So again, I, I do wanna thank you very much for the efforts, but I would encourage you to, to, to take our desires to improve 311 to heart and to use us to help you, um, and not to be uh, re reflexively uh, 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 in opposition to wise ideas that come from this body, like so many of your sister agencies do. Um, not everything that comes out of this council is dumb. Some things make sense, and I would encourage you to join with us and try to make it a little better for the people. And with that, I am grateful again to the chairs. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, Chair Cabrera. Uh, thank you so much uh, to the chair. And, uh, thank you so much, uh, Councilman Yeager. You always uh, ask uh, important questions in this committee. Uh, I just had two more questions, and one is regarding uh, your app. Uh, we can't seem to find uh, the option uh, for any other language. Is that because there is none or we're not looking? Um, that is, it is only available in English at this point. Do you have plans to provide in other languages? Um, I think one of the things, if I can reference what uh, the commissioner mentioned earlier, uh, kind of a sequence again, right? Um, we need the new CRM system. We need to then upgrade the mobile app itself 
and then we need to look at what options exist to be able to do enhancements, including uh, potential for language. We're going to have to uh, hire more developers. Uh, uh, <laughs> that I don't know. Is that what we right? need? Uh, more people not. to uh, work in this area. I mean, this is not. This is just mm -hmm. translating and 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 having an option, a drop option, right? Is that so? So without getting into the, 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 the technical aspects of how to enable multilanguage on a, on a native app, I can tell you the, the capability to do so will be a priority in the, in, as we talked about earlier, okay. um, when we deploy that, uh, that app into, that new 301 app into production. Recognizing multilanguage is a high priority for, for, the, for, this, for the city. I appreciate that. Uh, and my last question, as a matter of fact, uh, let me read this statement. For in, first, in the most recent MMR, 311 responded, reported that the average wait time f during fiscal 2018 was 28 seconds, an increase of 10 seconds from fiscal 2017, although this number is below the 30 second wait time uh, mark, it is the highest increase in wait time since fiscal 2014. Can you give us an explanation for the increase, uh, the, uh, the new variables that came into being? Uh, yeah, sure, happy to. Um, appreciate you noting it is within the standard, the objective of, of being under 30 seconds. The companion um, measurement to that is the service level that's also listed in the MMR, which is 80% of calls being answered within 30 seconds. So it's a key metric for us on how we manage the call center uh, to manage customer access. Um, the noted increase um, is in part due to the time period uh, last January if uh, you may recall, was quite different than this January in terms of temperature. Um, the first part of the season was incredibly cold. They had a, a significant increase in heat and hot water complaints over the course of that time um, that has then caused more people to call during that particular period. Um, the other thing is that during the course of last year, um, we started to take on uh, appointment requests for bulk item uh, collection. Previously, you could put your bulk item out. Now you go through a process that uh, you make a request for that, you make a, an appointment. So that added some, uh, you know, demand onto our onto our capacity. So did you, were you able? Did you have to hire uh, more people to compensate? I mean, in light of the fact, I mean, we're getting ready to go through a vortex. What do they call those? Uh, cold vortex, <laughs> cold weather vortex for the next month. Uh, so it seems that, that we're going to be having this. I mean, what are you doing during those times? I mean, do you, do you hire temporary yeah. uh, um, help, or our, how does that work? Yeah, our, our main approach in that is that uh, we do know it happens. Right? To some extent, it's extreme, as I mentioned last year. Uh, but we have a seasonal staffing model, so we're able to use the existing resources we have, and sometimes we pivot them. In the winter months, we tend to have more staff on earlier in the day. In the summer months, when you have thunderstorms in the afternoon and result in issues, we have more staff in the afternoon. So we're able to modulate uh, in order to meet those objectives that are in the MMR. What's the waiting time after 12 p.m.? After 12 p.m.? Yeah. The waiting time is, on average, always under 30 seconds. Um, but I mean, like, what's the average? Uh, um, do you have those number? If you don't, I, if you yeah, we, we, we do, we could look at data by what we call arrival pattern, but, but in general, whether you call in the morning, the evening, or overnight, uh, that the objective is the same, it's under 30 seconds. Who came up with the 30 second mark? I mean, what makes 30 second like the acceptable one versus 29 seconds, 20 seconds, 40 seconds? People will probably cringe when I start to answer this because I could spend hours telling you about the history of the call center industry that I was proudly a part of. Um, okay. But uh, it's an industry-wide measurement uh, that uh, looks at both either service or sales. Um, serv sales is a little bit uh, more aggressive um, and services concerned. But it's really basically said, what's the right tolerance level for a customer to be comfortable and not even realize that they're waiting? Well, you guys got it pretty easy compared to council members. Uh, there's, I won't mention a newspaper, but there's a newspaper that part of the way they, they judge us is if we don't pick up the call within two rings, uh, then uh, we, we get demerit <laughs> <laughs> in the uh, criteria system. So. Uh, you know, 30 seconds. So this is nationwide, it doesn't matter. Uh, this is business related, uh, business world, private, 
Yeah, the, the companies, so I, that's I the standard. The standard for the private sector is generally um, what we call 80, 30, 80% 80 of the calls answered in 30 seconds with the average wait time of 30 seconds or less. For government, my colleagues and other 311s, there's no one with a more aggressive uh, wait time, with, with more aggressive measurement than we do, and most actually have a lot longer time. They, they manage to a longer wait time. Do you know what it is in LA? LA is 90, I'm sorry, 80 seconds and 80% of the calls in 60 seconds. And that's why I moved from LA to New York City. Come on. <laughs> Used to live out there. So uh, I'm going to turn it back to the chair. Uh, but I want to thank you all. Uh, the information you provided is very useful. I'm looking forward to uh, seeing the unveiling of your new system coming out. Uh, and even more, uh, the upgrading of the system. Uh, what's dear to my heart here is the video uh, component. Uh, and if you're head of 911, uh, I would love to see this in 911, also our call center, um, that's more directed towards do it. The, you work with the PSAC, right? I do. And so uh, that way uh, we can literally save lives. Sometimes people could dial, instead of calling 911, they're calling 311. I'm sure you have those calls and emergencies, uh, but even, you know, in the PSAC. Uh, too, that we could uh, implement that. And I really appreciate that, you know, that's going to be part of your discussion uh, and, and see what's priority. And uh, also when it comes to the app uh, for language access. Uh, and so with that, I'll turn it uh, back over to my co-chair. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah. So I have uh, one more question before we go to public uh, participation. So when you uh, when you said when customers call you answer uh, less than thirty seconds, you mean you, the, is the operator and pick up uh, less than thirty seconds? That's it. Uh, yes, that, there's the measure from the time the customer calls and and there are a series of announcements that some that every customer hears. Some customers are satisfied with that and they hang up. So it's from the end of the announcement to the time the agent picks up the phone. 30 seconds. Because I thought the, the, the advertisement was more than 30 seconds. You know, the, the, the out in the street parking and, the, and whatever the city is doing, they, they do a lot of announcements. Uh, yes. Is that, a couple of minutes are there. Yeah, it, um, going through the alternate side parking piece is 37 seconds. Yeah. Um, a couple of years ago, we had many prompts. We've eliminated that now with the natural language application. But yes, you would hear that first. There was necessary announcements. Um, we identify it's 311, hang up and call 911 if it's an emergency. Obviously, that's a critical yeah. item. Um, so those announcements that you do here, the measurement that we use that I mentioned is from the time those announcements end to the time the agent picks up. But, but the, the problem is that like when people don't speak English, right? So if they speak Chinese right. or Korean, uh, you probably don't take more than 30 seconds. Uh, it, it could, um, but the same metric is the same. And, and even with language line, when we bring language line on, we have a contract with them that holds them accountable for being able to respond yeah. in a in a in, in 30 seconds time in a, in a performance metric uh, time. Because uh, we have a, um, a complaint from one of constituents when they call in Chinese, and they get transferred all the time, and finally they gave up. You know. Okay. I, I wouldn't As want you get transfer and then they, they put it on hold and transfer again and then put it on hold. Right. I, I, if you had that cir circumstance, we'd, we'd be more than happy to take a look at examples. Yeah. Uh, through that type of feedback, we were able to look at is there an issue with uh, you know, you know any, any aspect of it, the process or the technology. So you mentioned before that you have done customer uh, satisfaction survey and you were rated very high. Have you done surveys in other languages? In Chinese, in Korean, we have not yet. Yeah, uh, because this year. I, I think in English you probably do very good, but in other languages, uh, you are probably not that good. So I think you should do a survey, like how what you do in, in like, the most top five languages in like, we use in the city, right. and see how they feel. Yep. Because uh, there's one one uh, one page you have to uh, do a lot of improvement. I appreciate that feedback, and it is something we look at, is how can we expand our survey capability uh, to languages other than English. 
Okay. So, thank so you. Commissioner and Director and Director, eh? mm -hmm. thank you for your patience and time. And now we go to public transport participation. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. We have a second panel coming. Yeah. So the second panel will be Mr. Mi, Mi Mu, sorry if I mispronounce your name, and Mr. Sovi and Mr. Kim. So, yeah, you, Mr. Mimot is from the South Asian Community Center, right? Yeah. And Louis is from APA? CACF. CACF. And Ms. Kim is from APA KCS, right? KCS. Thank you. So, just identify yourself and you can start. Maybe Mr. Mimot, you want to start? Um, my name is Rehan Mahmood, and I'm the Director of Health Services at SACS, South Asian Council for Social Services. SACS focuses on three key areas, healthcare access and benefits enrollment, senior services, and food security. SACS also provides youth leadership programs, civic engagement, free ESL, and computer classes. We thank the City Council for giving us this opportunity to testify at this extremely important hearing. 311 is a key helpline which has been linking residents of New York City to vital services and provides important information. Though we have seen tremendous improvement on how 311 is being operated, still there are issues which our clients have identified while calling 311. These are not finding an interpreter who speaks the language, longer wait time, unprofessional interpreters, and rude behavior, especially with seniors. Most annoying for our clients is hanging up the call as the caller fails to speak English. Here I would like to share a few ex experiences. One of our clients who only spoke Hindi called 311 to complain about her building's elevator which was out of order for many days and the landlord did not repair it. The client first got confused as she heard the parking loose rules. She hung up thinking that she had called NYPD. After a while, she called again and waited for the parking rules announcement to end. She got connected to a 311 representative and started talking in Hindi. The person at the other end did not understand her language and hung up. The client came to our office. She was assisted by one of our case managers to directly file a complaint with the NY New York City Department of Buildings. Another client who spoke Telugu, which is another South Asian language, and understood very little English, found it hard to communicate with the 311 interpreter. The way he was translating the whole situation of the client being unable to pay his rent was totally different from what the client was trying to say. He only wanted someone to help him if he can get housing assistance from an organization who spoke his language. It is crucial that 311 be able to help those vulnerable clients who do not speak English and so come across forbidding challenges in accessing services. Thank you. Sure. So good afternoon. My name is Louis Sawi, and I am a policy coordinator of CACF, the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families. I would like to thank the Governmental Operations and Technology Committee in holding this important introduction of amending an uh, administrative code of the city of New York, which would develop a protocol for identifying languages spoken by callers to 311. CACF builds a community too powerful to ignore. 
It is the nation's only pan-Asian children and families advocacy organization and leads the fight for improved and equitable policies, systems, funding, and services to support those in need. We work with almost 50 Asian Pacific American, also known as APA, member organizations across the city to identify and speak out on many common challenges our community faces, including language access. There are over 100 Asian languages and dialects spoken in the United States, and at least 40 Asian languages and dialects spoken in New York City. The diversity of languages and dialects spoken by APA families makes access to government services and information challenging, and without language accessibility, these communities will continue to be isolated. Our APA community is growing, and we're growing quickly. According to the U.S. Census in 2014, 35% of APAs in NYC were linguistically isolated, which means that no one in the household above the age of 14 speaks English well. Most recently, the percentage of APAs who are limited English proficient in New York City rose to almost 45%. That is nearly half of the APA community. This means that in our families, children often have no choice but to serve as interpreters, causing additional stress and anxiety for them and their family. Last week, I myself attempted to call 311, speaking in Tagalog, the native tongue of my parents. The automated service didn't recognize the language and failed to respond to me accurately. Immigrants must have access to quality translation and interpretation services in order to be able to ask questions or raise concerns about their housing situation, locate the nearest health clinic if they become ill, report when their garbage is not collected by the Department of Sanitation, or understand the services and resources they are eligible for in this city. CACF fully supports uh, Bill Intro 1328, which puts in place an automated system to more accurately identify languages requested of 311, and also creates a system of reporting instances of call disconnects due to the failure of 311 providing appropriate language support. Such a software must be able to distinguish multiple languages, more than what is currently identified, including Asian languages. Data collected would be very useful in determining language needs of callers, including Asian languages, many of which are currently unknown. Data collected would also help inform the system as to beneficial changes that can be made to fully serve all limited English proficient uh, New Yorkers. New York City has been a leader on language access, and we hope the 311 Customer Service Center will continue to honor this commitment by ensuring its accessibility of quality information and resources to limited English proficient speakers. We welcome the opportunity to speak with you further about these issues. Thank you for considering our concerns and considerations. Thank you. Yeah, Ms. Kim? Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Yujin Kim, and I'm a project coordinator at the Korean Community Services. Um, I'd like to first thank Chair Cabrera and Chair Ku, as well as the members of the Committee on Technology and members on Governmental Operations for holding this um, public hearing today. Um, so for over 40 years, KCS, or the Korean Community Services of Metropolitan New York, has been operating under the mission of empowering immigrants so that they become independent and thriving members of the community. KCS primarily serves the Korean American community through its diverse programming in the areas of aging, education, immigration, workforce development, public health, and mental health. Um, for Koreans, language access is one of the countless barriers that they face. Um, as of last year, almost 70% of Koreans in New York were foreign born, and more than half of Korean New, Yorker, New Yorkers were limited English proficient. So this language and cultural barriers that they face are compounded by the fact that they're often unfamiliar with the city agencies or the city's social service systems and processes. This demonstrates the vital nature of language services provided by New York City, particularly through 311 Language Line. Uh, the provision of language access services by New York City is commendable, and it illustrates how committed the city is to serving its diverse population. Um, in order to help improve the customer service experience and the quality of services provided through the language line, I would like to share a few anecdotes with you. As a project coordinator that works directly with the Korean um, community, I have come across and heard of many unfortunate customer experiences with the 311 language line. Um, many of my clients explain that they have a very difficult time navigating the call, 
Um, also, they tend to avoid it altogether because it's so frustrating. Uh, so one of the reasons is when they call, um, it takes some time to get to the Korean language option. And once they have the patience and they know to wait um, and uh, press the option, which is number seven, uh, the, the uh, alternate site parking rules are announced um, in Korean, but it, it is very mouthful and it has a very thick dialect. Um, I have called as well, as well as my other coworkers who say that it's not standardized Korean. Um, they recognize a thick accent and sometimes they don't even understand what, what she's saying. So the quality of the voice recorded messaging is very poor to a point where people feel very awkward um, or they feel like it's very awkward. Um, uh, moreover, when the, the, the wait time until they are connected, a caller is connected to an interpreter, can be very, very expensive, which uh, leads to a caller just dropping the calls, thinking they were ignored, or they just they don't have the time. Um, it's very, very hard for especially seniors to wait on the line when they, not, when they don't know that the, they're being connected. Um, and they're confused once again when it's an English-speaking um, you know, counselor um, on the phone asking what they, what language you're speaking, um, because they expect it to be in Korean. Anyway, um, so callers with limited English proficiency, uh, this is a very trying and confusing experience, and they tend to avoid the services that they critically need. Um, so it's not only the provision of language services, but the quality of language services that is important for our community, um, especially for New Yorkers with language, uh, limited language uh, English proficiency to access services and stay informed. So it is imperative that New York City expands its language services and uh, develops a better software to accommodate. Um, so in this vein, we'd like to suggest the following. Um, Consult community-based organizations like KCS and others here to ensure the quality of any voice automated messaging, voice recording um, of any non-English languages before they are put into use. Also, we support the bill um, that introduces the implementation and introduction of a language identific identification software. Um, lastly, um, expand language access to more languages and um, New York City has always been a leading example in providing language access services to its immigrant populations. And we hope that New York City co continues to honor this commitment through considering the suggestion that we outlined. Uh, we welcome the opportunity to discuss this further with you and thank you for this opportunity. Council Member Cabrera, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I, I want to take a moment to thank you uh, all and all the advocates uh, because part of the reason we're having this hearing today was as a result of previous uh, hearings that we had had, and it was the advocates who brought the attention uh, of the problems we were facing, uh, our people are facing when it comes to language access, and as a result of that, it led to other things that are our awesome staff was uh, able to, uh, council staff were able to uh, discover. So I salute you all. I want to thank you uh, for your advocacy and your leadership. I did want to ask you, you I, I know you've been waiting very patiently here, but you heard uh, from the director of 311, the commissioner from Do It. Is there anything in particular, any red flags uh, that came to mind? when uh, you heard the testimony, anything that you said, hey, uh, we could do better in this area, any suggestions, anything that uh, fell through the cracks that we did not address today? I think I agree with what um, Chair um, Ku brought up about them using the Google Translate. Um, I, I understand that it will exponentially get better with deep learning, um, but as of now, it, it is so in inaccurate sometimes. Um, so I don't know if it's, if it's the best way to rely on Google Translate when I don't even do it to translate what I'm translating because it's always, there's context that's missing. Mm. Um, and the gross inaccuracies like that can lead to a lot of, you know, um, it's somebody losing their services, so. Indeed, anybody else? Uh, yeah, uh, so what we think is um, a crucial uh, for 311 is to have staff who are bilingual, uh, who speak multiple languages, because the language line that they use, the 
uh, the interpreter or the people at the other end, they are not trained by the city. They, um, maybe they're, they're in some other state or some other country. So it's better to have uh, staff members on, 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 their, on their staff who speak different languages. There are a lot of uh, 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 people in New York City who are born and raised in New York, they speak multiple languages. I myself speak uh, three languages other than English. So if uh, 311 directly trains them, they know how to handle the calls. They will be able to speak in different languages to the clients. That would be easier for everyone to understand, and especially our clients, because sometimes the dialects that the interpreters use is very different to the dialects that the client is, is talking in. So I think it would be very uh, um, like uh, important and would benefit benefit our clients that if uh, 311 has staff online that uh, are bilingual. And just to add on to what Rehan was saying, it's also important for the interpreters that speak these languages to be culturally competent because you're talking to immigrants, some of them who just literally just migrated to the United States and haven't figured out the cultural norms of interacting uh, within the American context. So it's important to have uh, interpreters that can accommodate um, those that literally just came into the United States and work with them within their culture. I know this is anecdotal, but <clears throat> have you found that a lot of the interpreters, they just learn the language, but they don't know the culture? Is this an anomaly? Uh, what are we talking about? Is this, this is, pattern or? This is just more of an anomaly. OK. Um, so, yeah. OK. All right, thank you so much uh, to my co-chair. I'll, I'll give it back to my co-chair. <clears throat> thank you for your time and patience. You know? uh, uh, this, this will be the last panel. Unless any more public participation? No? So uh, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you for having us. So yeah. we can conclude uh, the, uh, the public testimony. Yeah. The meeting is adjourned. Yeah. Oh, you didn't get it?